Good afternoon, Thanks. back everybody. Um, so uh, this is the second of Juan's lectures. Uh, so uh, it's over to you, you Juan. Okay, thank you. So um, I would I would like to start by um, answering a question that was asked in Slack, um, and the question was related to this uh, central dogma we mentioned uh, last time, and um, the question was whether we shouldn't think of the system as an open system because you have the black hole interacting with the environment outside. And uh, yeah, the answer is yes. So if you have uh, the black hole, and so the idea is that if you, you have some cutoff surface around the black hole and you replace the interior of the, inside this cutoff surface by some quantum system, and that quantum system interacts with the environment. So this dotted line uh, represents the fact that this uh, black hole system could also have some interactions with the quantum fields that are outside. Um, so, um, so in that sense, it's an open system in the sense that uh, the black hole can interact with the outside. But what the central dogma says is that it's not an open system in the sense that the black hole can interact with an unknown system that is in the interior of the black hole where things can go on and go in and uh, you, you lose information in that way. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the content of uh, this hypothesis. Uh, in some sense, what I'm saying here is that the interaction here with the exterior is something manifest. I mean, it's something you, we see directly in the gravity picture. The fact that there is a lack of, uh, the, the, the fact that information is not lost into the interior is not obvious in the gravity picture. And that's where the non-triviality of that central hypothesis lies. Um, okay, very good. So with that clarified, let me now um, move on. And uh, so we are now uh, going to go back to the Schwarzschild solution and um, discuss uh, an interesting aspect uh, about it. So this is the Penrose diagram of the full Schwarzschild solution, which uh, as we said, was understood 50 years after the original Russia solution was written. Uh, and it contains two exteriors uh, joined by an interior. And um, this, uh, this space time is, of course, time dependent and can be viewed as, um, well, as these two black holes. It can sometimes be viewed as a wormhole. So this Einstein Rosen bridge, or, well, this whole geometry. Uh, is uh, that of a wormhole in the sense that it joins two separate uh, asymptotically flat regions. And, um, but it's a non-traversable wormhole. So if you send a signal from the left side, it will never make it out to the right side. It almost makes it out, but it will always be behind the horizon and will not be able to make it out on the other side. Um, of course, uh, there are solutions with asymptotically flat space or asymptotically ADS space. They're very similar. Um, now, of course, this uh, well, th this solution is not; it's a mathematical solution, and we don't know how to make it use in a simple way uh, from non-singular initial data. We, we, we know how we can make it. We, we think we can make it if in some complicated way, but it doesn't arise through, let's say, some some very natural processes. By natural, I mean relatively easy theoretically, and also. Um, and also in nature. So we, we don't think we'll find uh, this in nature, in nature, in black holes we find in nature. However, there are some possibility and the question is uh, what we should make of this. Uh, so one option is to ignore them for the reason I was mentioning, um, because they are not easy to make uh, and they not, do not naturally uh, arise um, in, in, through natural evolution. So the black holes that arise through natural evolution have some interior and have matter inside, sorry, have a single interior, have matter inside um, and have a, a different geometry. But one question we can ask is whether we can interpret them in the context of this uh, central dogma we were talking about. And the idea is that um, we can apply this, um, the, this hypothesis or dogma to each of the two sides separately. So we take uh, one of the sides and then we say, well, there should be a quantum system describing uh, this black hole. 
And from this other point of view, we also have another black hole. So it should be a second quantum system that describes it. And then the idea is that the whole geometry is uh, a thermophile double of the states of that quantum system. So that um, that is the idea. Um, and um, OK, so then the, the time translation symmetry of this uh, geometry, which moves time forwards here and backwards here, uh, is also um, in, in this uh, description is a symmetry of the state, which is the difference between the right Hamiltonian and the left Hamiltonian. Um, now, one argument for explaining why this is the case is uh, via the Euclidean uh, solution. So we can consider the Euclidean black hole. And the Euclidean black hole has the, the geometry of a cigar. If you look at the radial and time direction, so time direction is a circle that shrinks to the horizon. And so we have this uh, geometry of the cigar, and we can cut it at uh, uh, in half. So um, on the boundary, we can cut it at these two points. And in the bulk, uh, we can cut it along this uh, particular slice. And this particular slice of the cigar uh, is corresponds to uh, this particular slice of the Lorentzian theory. So the idea is that we can imagine doing Euclidean evolution uh, from, let's say, nothing here up to these two points. And that Euclidean evolution produces the uh, disentangled state. So uh, we do evolution by half the size of the circle. And then after we do that, then we do the full Lorentzian evolution. Uh, so we can then continue to evolve in Lorentzian time. And the idea is that if we evolve either forwards or backwards in Lorentzian time, we get this full uh, space-time geometry. Um, so uh, one can call this uh, ER equal to EPR in the sense that the einstein rosen bridge wormhole is the same as the EPR correlations. Um, and so we see that this connectivity of the bulk is uh, related to entanglement. And if we think that the, well, we, we can vary the entangled state and that will vary the bulk state, it will be different. And uh, if we do uh, small variations of what we just discussed, for example, by sending in uh, extra particles and so on, uh, typically this, um, this wormhole will become longer and the, the left and right uh, horizons are going to separate from each other. Um, now, one question you can ask is uh, whether this is true for any system or, or maybe it's only true for large hand systems that have a gravity dual and are in a particular states. So for example, you could wonder whether if you had two black holes that are in a generic entangled state, whether they still have some wormhole, perhaps a very long wormhole, but you can still wonder whether, whether they have a wormhole. And we, we don't really know the answer to this question. Um, so we don't know the answer to the question of whether there is a geometry for a typical entangled state. Um, now, there is uh, one interesting lesson is the following. Well, what some interesting lessons are the following, so that entanglement can lead to these uh, geometric connections. Um, notice that if we look at the entanglement wedge of one side, so uh, imagine you are on this side and uh, we look at the entanglement wedge here, um, and including just the time evolution everywhere, uh, it will only cover this portion of the geometry, okay? Um, that means that uh, just from knowing the quantum system that describes the black hole from the outside, we cannot say what uh, this observer that falls in will experience as uh, he or she crosses the horizon. Um, what this observer will experience depends on what signal comes from the left side, and the right observer doesn't have any information about that. So um, even though you know everything about the black hole from the outside, you cannot say what the experience of uh, an infalling observer will be without knowing uh, the left side, without knowing what this black hole is entangled with um, and how it's entangled with the other black hole. Um, so uh, in particular, you cannot say that uh, this the interior geometry somehow is also described by uh, the exterior, by the, the black hole exterior degrees of freedom. So here, the interior geometry arises from the combination of the degrees of freedom on, of this black hole and the other black hole of the two exteriors, but not just from one interior. Um, and um, and we, we really need to know the, the other side. It's not 
it's not just an issue of precision. So it's not that uh, these horizons are due to our uh, limited precision and that if we did things more exactly, we would be able to figure it out, figure out what this observer would feel. No, it's, it's a question of uh, in principle. Um, so if indeed uh, the picture we said before is correct, that this wormhole is related to entangled states, um, it should not be possible to figure out what signal will come in from the left side by doing just measurements purely on the, on the right side. Uh, I mean, that would be uh, transmitting information to entanglement, which we think we cannot do. So, um, so these horizons are completely sharp, even in the exact theory. Um, um, okay. Now, this has some interesting consequence for the AMPS paradox that we discussed the other day. So the, the other day, yesterday, we discussed the uh, AMPS paradox as a paradox that involved uh, one uh, qubit, well, some, some radiation um, that is coming out of the black hole um, that is entangled with the interior mode, its partner, and it's also entangled with early radiation. So this black hole is supposed to be entangled with some other quantum system, and uh, this uh, radiation is entangled with that system that the black hole is entangled with. Now, in this particular case, the second system, the black hole is entangled, is actually uh, another black hole. So it's actually the black hole on the left side. And in this case, we can transparently see what uh, this qubit is entangled with. So this radiation, the, the qubit, um, the, the qubits corresponding to this radiation mode are entangled with the incoming uh, radiation of the left black hole. Okay. So, um, in, in other words, in the in the in the previous discussion, we were saying that this guy, uh, this outgoing mode, was entangled with the early radiation. So here we're imagining. Let's imagine we have a quantum computer. We take that early radiation, we collapse it into a second black hole that is in the thermofield double with the original black hole. Then the final space-time di diagram should look like this. And we, we had run into a paradox because uh, we wanted this mode to be entangled both, both with this uh, degree of freedom and also with, um, with the interior mode. Okay, And that was not uh, possible. But in this diagram, that is indeed possible because this uh, blue interior mode degree of freedom is to the future of this one, right? So in setting up the paradox, we imagine that the three qubits were on the same time slice, but we see that they are not on the same time slice once we, uh, for example, in this situation. And so this shows us how to resolve that uh, AMPS paradox for this particular uh, entangled state. Um, so, um, Okay, so um, so the, the 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 thing that was uh, that we were missing when we were talking about the original AMPS paradox was that we are not taking into account that um, that the outgoing radiation could be connected to the interior through this uh, type of wormholes. Um, so that, that that's a complete resolution of the AMPS paradox for the particular case that the black hole is in the thermal field double with the second black hole. Now, it's not really a resolution for a typical state. So exactly uh, what happens for a typical state is just still not understood. Um, OK, I would like, now like to make a side comment. Um, one is, uh, in these discussions, it's usually uh, useful to distinguish states versus space times. So, we, when we said that the thermofield double is uh, the same as this whole diagram, we're slightly being slightly imprecise. So the thermofield double is a particular state um, that is the state that we have at these two boundary times. And that state, uh, we think, descri is described by, um, we can think of that in terms of the bulk as a particular time slice. But we could also consider any other time slice. And in fact, all the different time slices are all related by uh, the Hamiltonian constraint and the equations for the equations of motion for GR. Um, and so we can give any of them and the state in any of them. And so uh, we could say that if we have the state at some particular time on the boundary, the natural correspondence in the interior would be to this particular um, uh, causal diamond or sometimes called Wheeler the Wheat Patch, um, 
which corresponds to taking the spatial slice and then all points which um, whose um, evolution or whose uh, yeah, uh, physics can be determined in terms of initial data on the original slice. Um, okay, so that's the initial state. And then uh, if we evolve, then we move these points uh, forwards and backwards, and then we get the whole state uh, together with the history and that uh, then will cover the whole space time and so the whole space time is not only the state but the state together with some particular uh, time evolution so and that's uh, the same uh, is true for the black hole so uh, the, the the whole black hole itself is not normally we talk of, of the black hole as a state but the whole space-time geometry of a black hole is really a state together with a particular uh, time evolution. And if we change the time evolution, and we'll see examples later, uh, we might uh, even not have a black hole because we, we change the time evolution in such a way that we don't, the horizon doesn't form and so on. Uh, so uh, that's something useful to keep in mind. Um, okay, so now I was planning to uh, give, uh, well, perhaps I should pause for questions now. I, I plan now to discuss a bit some simple models for black holes. Um, uh, but before I discuss that, maybe I should pause for questions. Now, there is one in the chat. Uh, Takato is asking, is the wheeler divot patch same as the domain of dependence? Yes, yes. So it's the domain of dependence of this uh, particular time slice that goes, of a Cauchy slice that uh, passes through these two boundary points. Any other question? Okay. Um, okay, so we, we'll discuss now uh, some simple models for black holes. Um, so one, one is tempted to think about quantum gravity as a theory of interacting gravitons. And I guess normally when we, uh, for example, talk about string theory, we emphasize the fact that the interacting gravitons is not, are not renormalizable in four dimensions, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, um, it's interesting to consider the fact that black holes exist even in theories of gravity that have no propagating gravitons. Um, for example, we can have black holes in two-dimensional theories of gravity or even in uh, three-dimensional theories of gravity. And we can think classically, we can think of these two-dimensional theories of gravity as uh, spherically symmetric reduction of higher dimensional theories. Um, of course, in the quantum theory, they are, they are really different because in the quantum theory, if we have really a two-dimensional theory, we're only considering the quantum fluctuations, which are uh, two-dimensional. Um, and two-dimensional theories are perturbatively renormalizable theories of gravity, so uh, so they are they they are nicer than four-dimensional gravity, though they have sometimes some issues when we sum over topologies, and only some special theories are uh, only we we only know how to do the sum over topologies for special theories. So uh, there is a particular two-dimensional theory of gravity that's been intensively studied in recent years. And this is uh, the so-called yakib teitelbaum theory of gravity. So if you uh, attempted to write the uh, Einstein action in two dimensions, this term uh, would be a purely topological term in two dimensions. So it will not depend on the geometry of the two-dimensional surface at all, which just give us something proportional, some number proportional to the topology of the surface. But we, we can certainly have this term and it will give a particular number weight by some constant we call S naught um, and so on. But then we can introduce an extra scalar. So we can have an extra scalar field. Uh, we could add a kinetic term for the scalar field, but we can do a field redefinition and remove it. Um, and so it's convenient to add it in this particular way. Um, and so that's uh, a slightly more interesting theory of gravity where um, the, there will be some, some dynam dynamics to it, but the very simple dynamics. And then we can even add some, uh, some matter. Um, so if, if we didn't add this term and we added matter to this so-called, let's say, Einstein, pure Einstein theory, uh, then because this term is topological, the stress tensor of matter would have to be identically zero. And so that would preclude any, any interest in dynamics. But this leads to um, the possibility of adding matter. And then if we uh, calculate the equations of motion, then the equations of motion will uh, fix this phi in terms of the stress tensor of the matter uh, up to a few integration constants. 
and the equation in the particular case that the matter doesn't couple to this field phi, then uh, the situation is even is, is very simple because the equation of motion for phi uh, sets the curvature to be exactly minus two. So the curvature scalar to be exactly minus two. That means that the metric is locally hyperbolic space. Um, so um, in this theory, there are no propagating uh, bulk gravitons, but as we will review in a second, uh, there is a, actually a boundary mode. So the, there is no two-dimensional gravity, but there is a sort of one-dimensional gravitational mode on the boundary. I should mention that this theory um, can be an approximation to two, 4D gravity when we consider the near horizon geometry of a 4D or, or even higher D near extremal charged black holes. Um, so that's a context in which uh, can be that's that's a higher dimensional situation that can be approximated by this theory. Um, okay, so uh, here we have a Euclidean uh, hyperbolic space, so the Euclidean version of uh, ADS two gravity or nearly ADS two gravity, and um, the idea is that uh, we have to put a certain cutoff surface. So we uh, are putting a cutoff where we are fixing, let's say, the boundary value of the dilaton, and also the length of this uh, boundary curve. Um, now, if this arises from higher dimensions, that would be the region where the near horizon geometry matches into some higher dimensional space. But the idea is that in the physical situations we will be interested in, we will uh, put this physical cutoff surface. Um, and so the region under consideration is the region inside the red line. Um, but we can consider fluctuations of this uh, cutoff surface. Um, so we have a bunch of curves that all have the same length that we can draw inside this idea space. Um, and they will have some action. And the action, uh, so locally, they will be the same as the original curve, but there will be a small action. Um, corresponding to it, and we can calculate it as follows. So we uh, start with the original Einstein action, and we are going to introduce the usual gibbons hawking <coughs> boundary term with some boundary value of the dilaton, which uh, we write it in this way. Um, U is the re is a rescale uh, proper length along the boundary. Um, and then it turns out that, well, the equation of motion for phi implies the cur this curvature is constant, and we have just hyperbolic space. Um, and so all that remains is the extrinsic curvature. And so we just simply have to calculate the extrinsic curvature of this curve. And we can parameterize the curve uh, by giving the angle with respect to the center of uh, this hyperbolic space as a function of the proper length of this boundary. Um, and when we do that, then uh, we find here a Schwarzian-like action. So this is just a matter of uh, parameterizing the curve and uh, doing a calculation. Uh, you can do it as an exercise. And uh, we get an action that involves the Schwarzian derivative of, the, uh, of that, that function, t of u. So here we can, uh, well, I was in the previous figure, I was sort of using this uh, global coordinates in h2. Here I'm using the Poincare coordinates, but you, you will get this Schwarzian action. Um, now, um, the, well, the dynamics. Question, yeah. yes. There's a question. Would you like to take it? Should we yes, think of GT gravity as an effective 2D theory after compactification, starting from 10D supergravity? If yes, can you comment on what is the precise com uh, compactification? Yes, yes, yes. So the compactification uh, would be um, one example is. Um, let's say ADS, ADS2 times S2 times uh, some, let's say, Calabi-Yau. You could have something like that. That's the near horizon of a black, near horizon geometry of a black hole. Um, that, that's an example. It's not uh, something that is important. I didn't, uh, well, perhaps emphasize it enough, is that uh, once you solve the equation for the, for the dilaton, uh, the dilaton is actually not constant. This scalar field is not constant in the solution. And so the full space doesn't have the ADS2 isometries. So you cannot view it completely as a compactification where um, the compactification all the way down to ADS2. So that's why we normally call it nearly ADS2. So it's a situation where 
uh, you have ADS2, but then some scalar field, some property of the compactification manifold is changing. Um, and it's changing in some sense slowly. So for example, um, when we are considering, the, considering these nearly extremal black holes, um, so the near extremal black holes have a, a throat, a very long throat that has this ADS2 geometry. Um, but um, the, the, the throat doesn't have a completely constant radius. And the whole radius of the throat can be, or area of the throat can be viewed as phi zero plus phi. And so phi zero would be much bigger than, phi, than this phi, uh, but this little phi is still varying. So there's a small change in the radius of the throat. Uh, okay, I hope uh, that was clear. Is there any other question? Yeah, so uh, there's one more question. Uh, Manish is asking, is uh, the wheeler divot the largest entanglement wedge one can consider in the two-sided ADS black hole? Isn't there a way to cover the whole space time? Um, well, yeah, you can cover the whole space time if you uh, if you evolve, right? So if you do time evolution. So if you look at the, uh, if you wish the entanglement wedge at one time, right? You will cover this whole region. Uh, but uh, if you want to get to this point, you have to do some time evolution to get to that point. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so now, so the, the, the bottom line of the dynamics of these uh, ADS2 black holes, uh, especially when we go to Lorentzian sig uh, signature, it's, it's very, very simple. So we have, uh, let's say, global ADS2 space. Uh, that's these two vertical lines. The, that's the Penrose diagram. There's a time direction going forwards and space direction uh, see here along the horizontal direction. Um, and then uh, there are two sort of boundary particles which describe the location within this uh, fixed ADS2 of the boundaries of the physical boundaries of uh, the space time. These are these red lines. Um, and these particles are dynamical particles that can, can have their own fluctuations and their own, their own wave functions. And they encode all the quantum gravity effects, all the perturbative quantum gravity effects of this uh, setup of this theory. In the bulk, we can have matter, and the matter propagates as if it is in a rigid ADS2 space with no back reaction whatsoever. And then uh, we have something like the thermophile double with a second, uh, second boundary on the other side. And the, the dynamics, in principle, of the left particle, the right particle, and the bulk, they look independent. But there is a constraint that relates them, uh, which is that we, they should form uh, a state that is SL2 invariant. So SL2 is the group of isometries of ADS2. Um, and um, we, the way we solve the problem is that we take uh, a wave function of this particle. So there, um, it's in some representation of this SL2. Similarly, the particles in the bulk are in some other representation. And there is a third representation here. And they should all form a singlet under SL2. What that physically means is that um, the only thing that matters is the relative position between the matter and these boundaries, but not their overall center of mass uh, position. So if we act with an ADS2 isometry on the whole system, uh, nothing changes. That's uh, what we get. And this is just simply uh, what remains of the reparameterization constraints of GR. So we do a partial gauge fixing when we uh, go to this ADS2 coordinates. Um, and uh, all that remains of the constraints of GR is this SL2 constraint. Uh, you, you can describe the same physics by um, working in completely gauging variant variables, but uh, this is a very convenient way of doing it. Uh, so for example, I'm going to give you here an example of how uh, back reaction is encoded in this, uh, in this picture. So suppose that you have some initial black hole, um, which uh, is empty. So it contains, uh, it has no matter inside. It contains the two boundary particles following this red trajectory, including this uh, dotted red lines. Uh, and then at some time t, we send in some extra matter. So when we send in some extra matter, um, we, we have some uh, non-zero energy going in. 
and this uh, has some of these SL2 charges. And physically what happens at this point is that we have some kind of local energy conservation and these uh, particles that go in give a little kick to the uh, boundary trajectory that push it a bit outwards. And so what ends up happening is that this uh, boundary particle uh, hits the actual boundary of ADS at some uh, earlier uh, time than before. The, the, the proper time along this line is actually infinite, uh, but uh, it, 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 it's uh, an earlier point along, let's say, this uh, global time along of this coordinate co in the coordinates that describe global ADS. Um, and that means that the horizon of the black hole has moved outwards relative to where it was before. And that's how the black hole uh, grows and becomes bigger when you send extra matter. Okay. So some particle that was uh, coming, that was in the exterior of the original black hole, once you send the extra matter would be behind the new horizon. Okay, so that's how we describe back reaction. It's very simple to describe in this case. Um, and in this case, you can, yeah, and by similar methods, you can describe the, any uh, perturbative quantum gravity uh, diagram. So you basically write uh, some Feynman-like diagrams where you have particles that uh, propagate in the bulk, um, in a rigid bulk. So these are the quantum fields that move in the interior. They might have some interactions. Um, and then uh, you have these boundary particles, which um, also propagate uh, in that uh, rigid ADS2 space. And you just compute this uh, Feynman diagram. So this is just uh, some, uh, some Feynman diagram with peculiar propagators. And you can, uh, you can compute them. And this, these computations include all perturbative quantum gravity corrections. So I'm not explaining you all the details. I'm just going to give you a little flavor of the type of results you get this way. So for example, you can calculate the simplest diagram would be a two-point function um, of some operators. And uh, this is the two-point function in the background, let's say, of, for some black hole. And you, you send in some matter. Um, so the O's are the matter fields that you are sending in. You are sending in, you're putting one operator at uh, one time and the other operator at some other boundary time. And by computing all these diagrams, you can compute them and find some answer, which you can uh, rewrite in some way. So you don't need to pay attention to all the details. All, all you need to see is that it is some very concrete, explicit expression uh, where all the formulas, all the functions here are known. Okay, And this has the feature that uh, for short, relatively short times, uh, this behaves like 1 over uh, u to 2 delta, so that this looks like a conformal behavior. But then for uh, larger times, what happens is that the, so for short times, the, the behavior of the boundary particle is essentially classical and follows a well-defined uh, circular trajectory. Um, but for very long times, this behavior becomes uh, more quantum mechanical. And so the quantum gravity corrections become large. And indeed you can compute. So this formula encodes all those uh, quantum gravity corrections. And at, for example, at very long times, it uh, develops into this very simple uh, functional dependence. Um, this just simply comes from, well, uh, you, you can check that that's the case. But uh, here, the important point is that uh, you can uh, encode all these quantum gravity corrections in this particular setup. And this formula is obtained, was obtained using those propagators, but can be reinterpreted as uh, as a formula that is um, um, that is what we would expect in a quantum mechanical boundary theory, where we have some operator O, and then we have some energy eigenstates. Um, in, a, in a quantum mechanical boundary theory, this, uh, this would be a discrete sum over energies. Um, but we could imagine that either because we are averaging or because we are not being precise enough, we really have a continuous distribution. And so we can compare uh, this expectation to the result we, uh, we obtained before. And we can read off, uh, well, that, that these functions row perhaps, that well, they look similar to this density of, could be interpreted as this density of states. And uh, these functions that appear here could be interpreted as matrix elements of those operators. Um, 
And so this includes all perturbative gravity corrections. There are also uh, possibilities of topology change. This would be uh, non-perturbative corrections that involve a uh, small parameter, which is e to the minus s naught. S naught is related to that parameter phi naught that we had before. That's the cost of making a topology change. Um, and for pure JT gravity, it's actually possible to evaluate all these terms in the genus expansion. I won't describe how to do it. It was done in, uh, in this beautiful paper by Sachenker and Stanford. Um, and you get some results which are the same as a certain ma random matrix model. Uh, so that's uh, the end of lecture one. And now we'll uh, start going into lecture two. But before doing that, uh, let's answer questions. Yeah, so there is one question. Uh... Takato is asking, uh, what is the definition of the boundary and how is it related to particle? Um, yeah. yeah, so so I was calling uh, the boundary. Oh, let me see what happened here. Um, uh, can you still see the screen? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so I was calling it a particle because the boundary is one dimensional. So it's, it's, uh, it has one uh, world line direction, right? It's one dimension less than the two dimensions of the space time. That's why I was calling it a particle. The uh, second reason for calling it a particle is that the dynamics of the boundary looks like the dynamics of a particle that moves in a rigid ADS2 space. Um, so that's the second reason. Um, and uh, What's the definition of the boundary? Well, the idea is that uh, we introduce a boundary. We, 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 the problem is defined uh, with a boundary. So um, we don't let the, this, this scalar field, uh, it grows as we approach uh, this region. And we cut off this growth at, growth at some position. And then we measure uh, the proper length along that position. And that defines the uh, boundary time. Um, and that, that's the problem we solve. It's by the definition of the problem, we introduce these boundaries. I try to uh, motivate why we introduce this boundary by, by uh, relating it to the four dimensional picture. So if we were dealing with a, an actual uh, black hole, near extremal black hole, uh, this whole discussion would be for the region near the horizon. Um, where the geometry looks like a uh, long throat uh, with constant uh, constant area, almost constant area. Um, but uh, this red line would be the, the point where that region with constant area goes over to flat space. Um, so that's, uh, that's a situation where the boundary really becomes some physical, something a little more physical. Uh, hopefully that was clear. Um, Okay, so there's another question by Manish, uh, who's asking, yeah. since there are no propagating gravitons, how good are the results we get? I don't know what he means, but uh, yeah. Um, sorry, say, say again what the question was. Since there are no propagating gravitons, how good are the results we get? Ah, uh, well, I mean, the, the, it's a theory without, they are good. They are good as results in two-dimensional theory. Now, I think the question is whether these are good as results in four dimensions, right? Um, he's clarified his question. So he's asking, is this really quantum gravity? Yes, yes. This is really uh, two-dimensional quantum gravity. So okay, you can consider quantum gravity in various dimensions. Quantum gravity in two dimensions is particularly simple, and this is what it is. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, of course, if we want to define our, if we want to describe our four-dimensional world, this is not particularly useful, except perhaps as an approximation to uh, four-dimensional black holes. Um, so this, this actually, for some questions, it's a good approximation to four-dimensional black holes. Um, there was a question by Shiraz saying whether we can obtain the density rho of E by canonically quantizing the bulk. Um, and what's the explanation from that point of view of getting a continuum for rho of e? And there are people who have at attempted to do that. Uh, there was a paper by Kochmeyer and uh, Jefferies. Um, and the, the idea is, is basically the following, that um, you look at the, uh, well, if you 
you, you really do not get the density, the, that density of states properly. Um, but let me try to sketch what the idea is. So you 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 look at the possible at the at these particles, these boundary particles. So when you quantize them, uh, they have a continuum of energies, right? Because um, they can be either deeper in or deeper out, and so this come with a continuous spectrum of energies. Um, and then the density of states would be um, this continuum, and there would be always there is an infinite factor when you have a continuum. And you can think of this infinite factor as the volume of this ADS2 space. Um, but in the context of quantum gravity, in the context of the formulas that I was writing before, um, in this density of states, there would be a factor of e to the s naught. So you might say, well, for some reason, the volume becomes e to the s naught. Um, um, so that's uh, well one qualitative statement. Um, but if you do this most naively, you don't actually get this inch factor. You get more like a tanch factor. And then people have done uh, various uh, other approaches so as to get this inch factor. But uh, I, I don't, well, at least I don't understand this, uh, this ideas very well. So um, I feel that if you hadn't derived this in some other way, you would not have believed your calculation of the density of states. Um, Um, okay, so um, I think there are no more questions. So we'll. So uh, Manish actually has uh, followed up on his question. He is asking, yes. for example, the behavior went from conformal to non conformal in the two point function. That looks interesting. Would something like that particular thing be seen in higher dimensions? Um, well, um this this behavior so the fact that we can do this calculation and it depends what you mean by higher dimension so if you are in a higher dimensional ads situation then the the two-point function would be conformal at all distances um the reason that we it's not conformal here at all distances is that this uh in ads2 we don't have an exactly conformal theory it's sort of nearly conformal and at long distances, the gravitational mode becomes strongly coupled, and its effects is what we are computing using this formula. Um, and it's something that uh, that's the only important mode is this uh, gravitational mode that becomes strongly coupled, and we can compute its actual quantum mechanics. Uh, so that's the interesting aspect of this formula. Um, so uh, all the effects of quantum fields in ADS2, they're all uh, invariant and they're conformal transformations. And the only effect that violates conformal symmetry is the dynamics of the boundary mode. Um, and that's what we're computing using these formulas. Um, yeah, I'm not doing justice to, uh, I'm not explaining it completely. I'm just giving you a little flavor of uh, what's involved. Um, Okay, so uh, there is another question by uh, Juan Zenchuel, uh, who's asking that at slide 73, the boundary is described by a particle in ADS2. Do you expect a string world sheet action for higher dimensional ADS? Um, um, yeah, I think, well, that's a good question. So if, if we, I think the question is, if we were, if we did this in ADS3 space, for example, um, there, there is also a boundary uh, mode, and the question is whether it can be viewed as a world sheet, as a string world sheet. Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I think some people looked a bit into this question, and uh, certainly they, there are studies of uh, this uh, boundary gravity modes that we have in ADS3, and there are various pictures for it. Um, but I don't know if it's uh, specifically you can view it as a certain string world sheet. Okay, so uh, then we'll uh, now go to the uh, lecture two. So in lecture one, we, we talked a little bit about everything, um, various aspects of information loss. And um, lecture two, I wanted to concentrate first on one very specific aspect and describe it in, in detail. So, um, so 
as, as we emphasized a couple of times, the an important property of black holes is that asymptotic time translations become boosts in the near horizon geometry, become these symmetries attacks act as boosts. Uh, and we'll study one uh, particular implication of this. So to motivate it, let's uh, consider the following, uh, the following situation. Uh, so imagine that we have uh, the geometry near a black hole horizon. Um, and then uh, imagine that we have an infalling particle at time equal to zero, and also an outgoing Hawking mode at time equal to zero. Um, these are this could be two different fields, and uh, the interaction between these fields uh, will be could be very weak. Okay, let's consider that that situation. Let's say they are just two different fields. Um, but now uh, we consider now an outgoing Hawking mode that comes out at the much late much later time, and we take that outgoing Hawking mode and we propagate it backwards in time until it crosses this infalling uh, particle at time equal to zero. Um, so this mode is highly blue shifted. And so now these two will cross at very uh, high energies. And so there appears to be a large interaction uh, between these two. And the large interaction comes due to gravity because the relative uh, energy between these two or the center of mass energy of this uh, collision is uh, very large. It grows like e to the uh, kappa t, where kappa is the surface gravity, um, or e to the 2 pi t over beta. So, so there are large uh, gravitational interactions uh, so that grow like g newton times s, and g newton is growing like this exponential factor. So the, uh, as we take time larger and larger, um, we, we get that these gravitational interactions become bigger and bigger. And the, the reason that they become bigger is simply because the center of mass energy becomes bigger and becomes bigger because the time evolution is acting as a boost. So the two particles are getting a relative boost, a boost relative to each other. And uh, that's, uh, that's what's happening. And this was, uh, this was pointed out by Dre and Toft, and they were, uh, well, they, they tried to give some interpretation to it for it. Now the question is whether this is uh, this is important for anything. So if we have the usual vacuum, we know that the infalling particle does not feel anything special when it crosses the horizon. So it doesn't matter that the black hole will emit some Hawking modes in the future. So we are um, so that will happen in the future. But when it crosses the horizon, we have locally the vacuum. Um, so one way to say this, that, that the later Hawking mode was not created yet, uh, perhaps a better way to say it is that uh, we have a series of Hawking modes uh, in the vacuum that, and the vacuum is invariant under time translations. Uh, so we'll see that when we, um, when we scatter the modes, uh, the net effect is a certain time delay. And since that's a symmetry of the state, we will not see any local changes. Um, and, yeah, so, so, and this doesn't look observable. Um, so in order to, to understand this better, we'll discuss a, a bit more the gravitational interactions between highly boosted particles in flat space. Um, so we'll discuss, so for forget about the motivation we just said. We right now will study the interaction between uh, particles that are fast moving. And, uh, and then we'll return to the questions we were asking. So uh, first we consider here this red line, which uh, is the world line trajectory of a particle that is moving almost at the speed of light to, to the left side. Um, and we can look, in order to understand the in gravitational interactions, we can view, we can look at the gravitational field created by this particle. And um, the gravitational field uh, looks as follows. So we have the metric is just the ordinary a flat metric, which we write in x plus, x minus, and y coordinates. So x plus and x minus are two of the uh, two of the coordinates, so time and one of the space coordinates, and y. The rest are the rest of the uh, transverse coordinates. They are perpendicular to the surface of the screen. Um, and so the 
we can derive the metric produced by this particle. One way to derive it is to take uh, the Schwarzschild metric and take a limit where you boost the Schwarzschild metric and decrease the mass of the black hole. And if you do that, uh, you get this limit in metric, which is a delta function in X plus. So it's localized, the metric is localized along this red line in the X plus direction. Uh, it's translation invariant along the Y direction, uh, along the X minus direction. And then uh, in the Y direction, it's a uh, solution of the Laplace equation in the Y directions. The metric is proportional to G Newton times the P plus. So P plus is the total momentum along the uh, plus direction. Now, when we look at this light concordance, it's convenient to derive the, to, to define the momentum with a lower index. So that is equal to the derivative of the coordinate uh, without any metric factor uh, or said in another way, the wave function looks like e to the p plus, x plus, etc. So p, the momentum naturally has a lower index. Um, and um, so when you define it this way, the uh, p plus uh, is, is negative definite. So this quantity minus p plus is uh, positive. Uh, now, in order to, to figure out what happens with a particle that, uh, so now we want to consider a probe particle that uh, passes through this uh, shock wave, and uh, we want to find what happens to it. And it's a little confusing at first because we have this delta function in the metric. And one way to deal with it is the following. So we can uh, define a new coordinate x tilde minus. Uh, notice there is dx plus dx minus, and then there is a dx plus square here. So we are going to redefine this coordinate in such a way to so as to eliminate the delta function. We we will create some other terms, but the first goal will be to eliminate the delta function, and we can do that through this uh, coordinate transformation. So uh, where we take x minus, so it's basically we are just removing this term. Um, and in the new coordinates, uh, the delta function has disappeared. And we have a metric that looks a bit like the flat space metric. And then there will be some other terms that will contain this delta function and so on. But now in these coordinates, we expect that the trajectory of the geodesic as we, um, as we cross as uh, we cross x plus equal to 0, uh, x minus uh, tilde should be continuous, because it's just that, that there's nothing discontinuous, such as a delta function in this metric. But if x tilde minus is continuous, it means that the original coordinate x, plus x minus uh, will have a jump. So in terms of the original uh, coordinates, uh, the, the trajectory will have a certain, a certain jump. Okay? And the jump has a specific sign that you can figure out from here. So if, if x tilde minus has no jump, then x minus will have a certain jump proportional to this quantity. And the jump is along the x plus minus x minus direction, the positive x minus direction, and it corresponds to a time delay. So the overall trajectory looks more like the trajectory of a time-like part particle uh, of a time-like trajectory. So the main effect is this time delay. Um, there are other effects that I'm not discussing, like there is a small angle deflection that will involve the first derivative in the y directions. Uh, and there are also tidal forces uh, when you go to the shock, through the shock. Um, they are proportional to uh, the Riemann tensor, which uh, has only this plus i plus j components and have to do with, they're related to second derivatives in the y direction. And this can be relevant for strings or other extended objects. And so, for example, a string can get excited by crossing the shock wave. For in particular, for example, a graviton can go into massive string state. Now, this, these are just side comments. Uh, they are not important for what we are going to discuss. Uh, so the, the fact that it's going to be important for our discussion will be this time delay effect. Um, so what we see is that there is an interaction between the infalling particle and those outgoing particles in the near horizon geometry. And the main interaction is this time delay. Um, and uh, this time delay grows as the relative boost increases. So we go back to uh, this discussion. We see that the time delay is proportional to P minus. And as the relative boost between the two particles increases, this P minus also increases. Um, OK, so um, for the moment, so our goal is to, to give some interpretation to that, to that effect. 
but uh, we, we're going to, for for a moment we're going to stop talking about black holes and talk about quantum many body system in particular about chaos in quantum many body systems and we, we'll see that this interaction we were talking about has something to do with chaos but first uh, in order to explain that we have to talk a bit about chaos in quantum many body systems um, and before we do that, we have to say a few words about chaos in classical systems. Um, so chaos is related to the fact that similar initial conditions can lead to rather different outcomes. So for example, you have some dynamical system that is uh, moving in some phase space, so the blue region is the phase space, and you start with two nearby trajectories, and then they start exponentially diverging away from each other, and eventually they reach uh, well, some various generic points in this phase space. So here uh, there are two dynamical regimes. One is this leading deviation, exponential deviation in the beginning. And then after a while, uh, this grows so much that they are two generic points in the phase space. So the typical distance uh, between the points will be the typical size of the distance in phase space. Okay, That's what will happen at late times. We are going to discuss right now this initial exponential deviation. We are not going to worry about these late times. Um, now, an important issue is that uh, if we look at the thermal state, so we have some chaotic system and we look at the thermal state, the thermal state is uh, invariant under time uh, translations. And it's related to the fact that the uniform density in phase space goes to a uniform density in phase space. Um, and so, it's difficult to see this exponential deviation of nearby trajectories if we look at simple uh, expectation values in the thermal state. Um, now in order to understand what we should look at, let's, uh, let's, um, let's look at this issue of the deviation between nearby geodesics a little more. So we're imagining that if at time equal to zero, we start with some point in phase space, then we'll end up at some other point in phase space. So here I and J are various particles. So this could be the initial position for all the particles. And these are the final position for all the rest of the particles, for all the, all, the other, all the particles. In particular, we could imagine changing the uh, initial uh, momentum of one of the particles. And then that will lead at time T to a change in the position and momentum of all, all the other particles. And the change in the position of the jth particle um, is equal to, well, the derivative of the coordinate at time t with respect to the initial, uh, the initial conditions times the change in the initial conditions. So it's, and this can be expressed as the Poisson bracket between uh, qj and qi zero, uh, well, qi at yeah, this initial condition. Um, now, of course, um, yeah, so this Poisson bracket could be, uh, could have either sign. And if we were to average it over the, over the phase space, it might uh, lead to cancellations. So it's a little more convenient to try to look at the square of this Poisson bracket. So for example, the square between uh, the position of the particle J at time T and the initial condition of the particle I at time zero. Um, so uh, this square, is uh, positive, and uh, as time grows, we expect it to grow if nearby trajectories are growing. And we can define uh, the average growth by looking at the expectation value of this in, by averaging this over the phase space. And since, since uh, for each individual trajectory, uh, this is positive, so this will give us something positive and will give us something that grows with time. Uh, we expect it to grow with time exponentially in the at least in, for early times, and um, and we are going to define we can define a Lyapunov exponent to be that exponent of how it grows with time. Um, so that's uh, in a classical system. Uh, we could do that, and um, this that whole discussion was to motivate the definition uh, definition we are going to make right now for a quantum system. So we're now we go back to the situation where we have a quantum many body system. And in analogy to this observable here, we are going to define an observable that will involve uh, the commutator between an, uh, part, uh, a simple operator at time t 
and a simple operator at time zero. Um, the, the, the key point here is that the, the simple operator at time t, it's complicated at time zero. And it becomes more and more complicated as uh, this time, as the difference between the two times is uh, larger. And so the idea is that we could have a quantum many body system as uh, just to be concrete, we could be like a spin chain or a system of spins. And W could be uh, the poly operator of one of the spins and V could be the operate, poly operator of some, uh, of some other spin different than, than, than W. Uh, but, um, okay, so now this uh, commutator is equal to the sum of four terms, um, well, some, and some, some come with a minus sign, and um, this we can divide into roughly two, two different sets. So one set uh, involves operators, which are time order. By time order, I mean that we start with the operator at time zero, then we go to the operator at time t, then time t and time zero. So this type of correlators can be viewed, for example, as uh, the uh, expectation, as the inner product of a state or as um, expectation of something that arises through evolution backwards and forwards in time, which is what we uh, get when we are trying to compute expectation values uh, in the well, uh, ordinary expectation values. So for example, here we can consider this to be a state that we act with operator W at the time equal to zero, and then at time equal to T, we can compute the expectation value of this two-point function. So this is something that in principle is easy to measure uh, because all the operators have a natural time order. Um, but there are some other operators which have uh, an unnatural time order where uh, we act with some operator at time t, then we go back to time equal to zero, then we go forward to time equal to t, and so on. Um, so those are the so-called out-of-time order correlators. Um, now, the idea is that at early time, so when time is close to zero, uh, these two operators act on different spins, so they almost commute. Um, and so uh, this is going to be zero. And it's zero because, because the commute, these two terms, uh, these two types of terms cancel. Now, the idea is that the, uh, the second type of term um, is basically independent of time. So this two-point function, um, so we act with w equal to zero. So we get some two-point function, then we calculate the two-point function at the later time, and uh, we get essentially the same answer. Um, so these two, these two terms uh, do not grow with time. Um, and the idea is that this guy grows in time because uh, the out of time order correlators are going to decay with time. Um, and so we expect that the, the, um, this commutator will uh, grow, will be small of order one over n. Um, n is the number of uh, parts of the system. Recall that these operators are acting on different spins. So their interactions, uh, well, they're the size of the commutator will naively be expected to be one over n. Or you can think if it is a large n gauge theory uh, that these two are two different single trace operators. Um, so it, formally it's a further one over n. Uh, n could also be the entropy of the system, um, but it's a correction that grows with time, okay? So in other words, uh, we are looking at this out of time order correlator. Um, and at time equal to zero, this is close to one plus one over n corrections. And then there will be a particular one over n correction that uh, grows exponentially with time. And it's a correction that tends to make this out of time order correlator decay, okay? And this behavior is correct as long as e to the lambda t is not uh, much bigger than n. So that's good for times, um, times which are short compared to the so-called scrambling time, which is one over lambda times the log of n. Um, so at those times, the uh, behavior, well, the, the, the full uh, four-point function is expected to uh, decay to zero. And the picture for why the commutator grows is uh, a kind of operator growth picture. So the idea is that we imagine that uh, the Hamiltonian of the system is the so-called k-local Hamiltonian. So it's a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of terms, each of which acts on k qubits at the time. 
And um, large hand gauge theories are of this type, as, as we mentioned in the very beginning. Um, and so if we start with V of zero and we start doing time evolution, so the first step of time evolution, if you wish, the first derivative of the time evolution operator is just commuting with the Hamiltonian. And um, that if we represent uh, V as a single, uh, as a spin on a single side, and then when we commute with the Hamiltonian, we might get uh, the spin at uh, various uh, other sides. So in this particular example, uh, let's say we got uh, the spin at uh, three other sides. And then uh, we take now the second derivative. So we have com commute again with the Hamiltonian. And each of these could uh, pick up a term in the Hamiltonian that connects it to uh, three others. And then we can do it again and again and again. Okay. But what you see is that the number of operators that we are generating uh, grows exponentially with time. So, and this will go on until the operator V of t will contain a sum of terms, uh, each of which contains roughly all of the operators of the system. And this is what happens at this scrambling time. And so that's when the operator sort of stops growing in this particular exponentially uh, growing way. Um, and, uh, and after that, it continues to evolve and get more complex, uh, but it's a different type of evolution. So we're concentrating on this initial uh, exponentially growing um, evolution. Uh, now we can think of the OTOC as the overlap between two states. So we take uh, chi and psi. So psi could be, uh, let's say we have the thermophile double, um, and then we act with v, w of zero and then v of t. And then chi, we act with v of t and w of zero. So we act in the opposite order. Um, and then we can compute this overlap. So that's uh, just a simple identity. And we'll use this identity to try to relate this to the correlators in the black hole background. So now we, we go back to the black hole situation. And we are going to imagine that these operators v and w correspond to operators that create um, a particle in the black hole background. Um, so for example, we have here the near horizon geometry of a black hole, and we act with some operator w of zero. On the state, we roll forwards in time, so then the uh, state sort of, uh, the, the particle goes in and falls into the horizon. Um, then uh, we act with the operator v of t. So that would create a particle that, again, would, if we evolve forwards in time, will fall into the horizon. But now we evolve the system backwards in time. So as we evolve backwards in time, this particle maybe bounces off from the boundary or comes out of the operator that created the other particle and, um, and follows a trajectory that goes, um, well, that would correspond to a particle that was coming in uh, in, in, in this way, okay? So um, now we can evolve it backwards in time, and then here we'll have a collision between the one that, if we continue evolving this one backwards in time, there will be a collision here. But we stop, uh, we stop the evolution before we get to the collision. Um, then uh, we could do the, the same thing in the opposite order. So first uh, we act with the operator V, so that creates a particle here, and then we evolve it backwards in time until uh, we get this particle. Uh, and then we act with v of zero. So uh, after we will be backwards in time, we act with v of zero. Um, and then that creates a particle that comes in here um, and will eventually collide with this particle that was uh, created here by v of t. Uh, so, um, so now we are supposed to compute the overlap between these two. And this overlap looks, a, looks like a scattering amplitude where we have an incoming state, which is this one, and an outgoing state, which is this other one. And so the idea is that the out of time order correlator is uh, looks like a scattering amplitude where we have some incoming states and some outgoing states. Um, and the uh, we, we know what this scattering amplitude is. It's uh, this uh, scattering uh, through a shock wave. And uh, its main effect is this time delay that uh, Grows, grows with the energy, it grows like e to the uh, lambda t over beta, okay? So uh, what we see here is, so this whole discussion was to explain that this, uh, this type of scattering amplitude can be probed by looking at this out of time order uh, correlators. 
and whose computation would require you to, um, I mean, if you wanted to compute this experimentally in any system, you would need to uh, act with operators and then evolve uh, forwards and backwards in time. So you need to have a lot of control on the system to be able to actually measure such things. And there are, um, well, there are some measurements using nuclear spins that do something similar to this. Um, uh, it's called Lakshmi Echo. Um, anyway, so uh, what we what, what we see is this exponential growth uh, that we were seeing in the growth of the scattering amplitude can be viewed as uh, the exponential growth that we have in a chaotic system for this type of correlators. And so we can read off from here a kind of Lyapunov exponent, uh, which in this case would be proportional to the temperature. Um, with a specific coefficient. Now, it's possible to argue that for general many body systems, this particular lambda is actually the maximum possible uh, value. And I, I want to explain why that is the case, but I'm only going to give a bulk rationale for this. So the, the idea is that when you look at the amplitude at the scattering S matrix, so causality implies that the scattering S matrix should be analytic in the upper uh, half S plane. Um, and also should be smaller or equal than minus, well, smaller or equal than one. So we shouldn't uh, produce probability. Uh, I mean, we, we might be less than one if, uh, if uh, two particles go into four particles as opposed to just two particles. Um, so in gravity, we get this answer, which is uh, consistent, consistent with this. Um, but if we had a different exponent, so a different lambda would correspond to a different exponent in the S dependence. Uh, the factors of I here come uh, from, there is some argument that says that um, S should be real along the, when the, the capital S, which is the S matrix should be real when the S, uh, little s is, um, goes along the vertical axis here. So that implies this I here. And then if, if this power A is uh, too large, then um, it would mean that if um, S cannot be, capital S cannot be uh, less than one, both in this region and in this region, okay? Uh, so that's where the constraint on A being less than one comes from. Um, so if, if A was bigger than one, then let's say we arrange things uh, so that capital S is small here, then it will be, become large somewhere else. Um, so that's a bulk rationale for this, uh, but there is also an argument purely in terms of quantum many body systems. Um, uh, okay, yeah, this is the argument in more detail. Um, so the conclusion is that black holes are maximally chaotic in this uh, partic with this particular definition of what chaos means. There are many definitions of what quantum chaos means, but this is a particular one. And with this particular definition, uh, black holes are maximally chaotic. Um, and so this implies in particular that the quantum system that was appearing in the central dogma, so the quantum system that is describing black holes should be very strongly coupled. Uh, not, not just strongly coupled, but very strongly coupled. So weakly coupled systems have lambdas, uh, which are of order decoupling. Uh, and that's smaller than this, um, so uh, well, that's very small. And also, these features suggest that the uh, these features of quantum chaos suggest that the dual quantum system also has a local k local Hamiltonian. So this is something that you could argue. Well, you could um, if you didn't know about ads CFT and you didn't know anything about uh, what the dual quantum system is. This is somehow a consistency check that uh, the quantum system has some kind of k local Hamiltonian. So Juan, there are a bunch of questions yes. in the chat. Yeah, let's discuss okay. questions. Yeah, please. Okay. So the first question was a few minutes back. So this is regarding this operator growth. So Jen Hui, yes. who yes. you is asking, what is the direction of this growth? In other words, why is the expansion of the order of the Hamiltonian valid? So. Uh, um, well, by direction, I guess uh, this is not a growing growth in space. I mean, it can be growth in space if the system has a space direction. Um, so, for example, in a spin chain, it would indeed be a growth in space, um, but uh, 
the most interesting case, I guess, for the black hole applications would be systems where you have a bunch of spins with all-to-all -all interactions, but with a k-local Hamiltonian. So each each term in the Hamiltonian can interact with any other uh, spins, but a small number of them. So each term can interact, let's say, with three, four spins, uh, but it could be any of the four spins of the system. Um, and so when we talk about growth, is we mean that one of the Pauli operators become, uh, after you evolve it in time, become, let's say, four, and then becomes eight. So it becomes a bigger and bigger exponentially growing number um, of Pauli operators with no particular spatial organization, just distributed in this uh, system. Um, okay. So uh, I, um, I hope I answered that question. So there was another question asking, how are the operators in OTOC and particles related? Yeah, so um, let me go back. Um, so here the idea is that uh, these operators could be field operate. So in the bulk, they would be just field operators that create particles. So this would be, let's say W could be one scalar field and uh, V could be a different scalar field. Um, and the scalar field acting on the vacuum creates a particle. Okay, let me go back to the chat. Um, um, okay, I, I guess I'm not following the, the chat, perhaps if people can ask other questions. Yeah, so Manish is asking, uh, re regarding this question, uh, uh, VW produce different particles, but where is the back backwards forwards evolution bit in the OTOC? Um, yeah, so um, so we, we have we have these particles, right? Um, and the backwards and forward evolution was involved in setting up the initial states, right? That, that describe the scattering process. We start with the black hole and then we created two states. To create those states, we need to evolve forwards and backwards in time. So that, that was related to the previous transparency. Uh, when we were talking about this picture. So for example, to put this particle in here, we needed to act with an operator in the future and then evolve backwards in time and then act with this operator. Um, right. Um, okay. Takato is asking uh, the last statement in your uh, slide where you stopped, why yes. is strong coupling needed to achieve maximal chaos? I think this is, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, well, I mean, if, if you had weak coupling, then uh, the, so you can calculate what lambda is for weakly coupled systems, for some weakly coupled systems, and you typically find that lambda is a further G squared. You, you would expect that if the coupling is small, lambda would be small because the operators would not be growing very fast. Um, uh, you, you don't create enough operators. Um, uh, Budhati is asking, uh, is there no distinction between scrambling and chaos in large N systems? Um, well, scrambling is is uh, is more specific in the sense that it, it means that uh, a simple operator, as you evolve it in time, becomes an operator which uh, whose commutator with all the other simple operators is a further one. Um, that's uh, what scrambling means. Um, that the operator grows to cover essentially the whole system. Um, but yeah, so in order to have scrambling, you need chaos. Um, okay. And the last question that we have in the chat box is from Bhave, who is asking, uh, we know that VT, the outgoing mode, is at a later time relative to W0, the falling mode. So is it correct to think that at time equal to t, the ingoing particle has crossed the horizon? If yes, then when we evolve the outgoing particle backwards in time, how are, how are we sure that we find the incoming particle for any interaction to happen? Yes, 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 yes. So um, one interesting aspect of this calculation is that all the particles are can be viewed as being outside the horizon. So all the particles are very close to the horizon, but outside the horizon. Remember that time evolution is a boost, right? So uh, lines of, for example, constant time are 
lines that go uh, radially from uh, this vertex point here. Uh, okay, so we can talk uh, always about uh, uh, about these particles as being outside the horizon. So this whole phenomenon is something that is occurring in the very, I mean, very close to the horizon, but outside the horizon. Um, and that's also one, one point that makes uh, this discussion interesting, is that it is exploring this very close to the horizon geometry. Um, but yeah, in this discussion, we never had to say what the black hole is entangled with, for example. So that's also something that tells you that uh, we don't need to go inside. We, it's something that uh, is happening outside. Okay, Shiraz has a question. So maybe Shiraz, you can unmute yourself. Let me just uh, figure out for the, uh, one second. Let me locate you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, better... yeah, yeah, was your amplitude computed at fixed impact parameter delta? Yes, yes, that's a, a fixed impact parameter. Or you can also view it as uh, working uh, partial wave by partial wave. Uh, and so we, we, we should expect that for any given partial wave, the scattering amplitude is bounded by S or S square. Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. I think so. I haven't thought about all the details of the partial wave, um, but I think that's uh, that's true. Okay. So there are no more questions. Let's uh, just make a final point about this, which is that. Thinking about black holes uh, was also an inspiration for a bound that now applies to many body quantum systems. So this bound on chaos is just a bound for many body quantum systems. You can apply it uh, regardless of the connection to black holes. Um, another point is that what looks like chaos in the quantum description looks like a classical tree level, lo looks like classical tree level gravitational dynamics in the bulk. So the scattering of shock waves is just uh, you know, classical physics in the bulk in some sense. Um, classical in the sense that tree level amplitudes are classical. Um, now let me make now make a comment about non-maximal chaos and stringy corrections. So as, as we said that gravity gives rise to maximal chaos, but general quantum systems can have non-maximal chaos, right? So you can ask what modification of gravity gives non-maximal chaos and the chaos is maximal due to the spin of the graviton. So when we consider the, um, the scattering between waves, the fact that the in exchange particle, which is the graviton has spin two, uh, that's what gives uh, the behavior under boosts. So the fact that it grows under boosts is related to, that it grows in this, with this particular power uh, is related to the spin two. Um, so, and it turns out that uh, in order to have non-maximal chaos, you need to consider string amplitudes. So, well, at least the string amplitudes are, are a particular way to get non-maximal chaos. That's a more precise statement. In other words, in gravity, we have scattering amplitudes, which uh, grow, grow like a squared. So before I was put in the S matrix. So when you go from amplitudes to the S matrix, there is a kinematic factor of S. Um, but when you look at strings, uh, then uh, the in high energy, the, if you take the Veneziano amplitude, for example, or the Pirasoro Shapiroar amplitude more precisely, uh, you uh, find that um, the behavior is modified by this power of uh, the momentum transfer. And the momentum transfer in this context will be negative and of order the radius of curvature of uh, the black hole or, or ADS, um, if it is a black hole in ADS. And so we get the power which is slightly less than the power you get in gravity. Um, and this leads to a correction to the Lyapunov exponent, which uh, goes like one over R squared. Um, um, okay, so the, the whole point of that transparency was to um, explain how, how you get non-maximal chaos, so that the stringy corrections tend to reduce the amount of chaos. Um, in some sense, uh, yeah. Um, let me see, how are we doing with time? Uh, oh, we are almost done. Um, okay, so the, there is also a sense in which this uh, chaos in the OTOC creates a kind of chaos in the S matrix, 
So imagine that um, we send particles into the part particles that are forming the black hole, and then you are watching the particles that come out, and you are computing the uh, what can be called the black hole S matrix. You, know, you send some particles in that form the black hole and so on, and then the black hole Hawking radiates and uh, defines, uh, and, and you can calculate the S matrix, S matrix in that way. So what this means is that you are calculating some particular matrix elements for situations where the intermediate states are black holes. Um, so if we send an additional particle at time equal to zero, um, then imagine you are computing this as matrix element, and now you send an additional particle at t equal to zero. Then the particles that come out at time equal t suffer a time delay relative to what they would have had if you had not sent the additional particle. So that's, um, that's the, an, another way you can think about this effect. Um, now, so that was a side comment. So now uh, another comment. So we can look at uh, even longer times. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe I'll skip this comment and ask uh, whether there are any questions. Maybe we should just uh, end with questions. OK, so there is one question in the chat box. Uh, Buzadite is asking, do we expect the Lyapunov exponent for OTOC for CFT dual to any ADS black hole to satisfy the MSS bound in the sense of maximal yes. chaos? Is that yes, expected yes. to hold in all dimensions? Yes, yes, yes. The answer is yes. So that's that holds for any black hole uh, in all dimensions and any non-ADS black hole, Schwarzschild black hole, and so on. Um, Presumably yeah. for higher spin theories as well, maybe. Uh... Um, well, yeah. So that's uh, depends on what you mean by higher spin theory. So the only the only reasonable higher spin theory is uh, is string theory. So if you if you just simply have gravity and you add if you add just a field of spin, let's say four, uh, then you would violate the bound. Uh, but you also violate causality. It's not it's not a reasonable theory. Um, so in string theory, you have particles of all spins, and they all sum up. So naively, each spin give you, gives you something that will naively violate the bound. But when you uh, you should really sum all over all these particles, um, and when you essentially sum over all these particles, you get the the result that we that we had seen before with the, well this result here. Um, this is something that was understood in the very beginning of uh, string theory. Um, and well, it was actually was partly the motivation for string theory. So I was trying to understand what happens when you exchange particles of very of all of all spins. Great, thanks. Uh, Shivam has a question, so let me unmute you. Hang on a second. Yeah. So Shivam, you can go ahead. Ask. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. I think. Uh, uh, in this whole analysis, we have assumed that the perturbation introduced by this V and W operators cannot change the uh, initial state significantly, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes, there are and, small perturbations, yeah. And but but do uh, do we have any comment to make when this is not true, or we have a perturbation which changes the initial state uh, more or less significant? I mean, significantly far from equilibrium, I guess. Um, yeah, so you you you. You could consider some other modifications where you, you, you make a bigger perturbation. Perhaps uh, within the context of small perturbations, the, the situation that is uh, perhaps closer to, to your question is this question of, um, of what happens at very late, at very late times, right? So when times are so big that this collision is very large, right? Um, then, um, th then when you send the particles, there is a very big time delay. Um, and there's a very small overlap between the incoming and outgoing states. So naively, that would tell you that uh, this uh, OTOC is very, very tiny. Um, but it turns out that the actual OTOC is... Uh, is um, so, so whenever you do a calculation and you get something very tiny, you have to... Um, you have to check that perhaps there is some other way you could get something that is not so tiny. And, the way that happens here is that even though I was uh, drawing the particles as just uh, 
uh, straight lines. Uh, the particles have some wave function. And so, for example, if you produce a particle at time equal to zero, it, um, it, it, it will decay into the black hole and uh, will decay with a quasi normal mode frequency uh, that is, uh, well, particular to that particle. Uh, and then when you have the other particle at time t, there is some probability that they interact at, uh, at that late times. For example, that there is something remaining of the initial particle at late time, some long tail. Um, and that's what gives the biggest contribution to the OTOC. So that's uh, how you can calculate the OTOC at late times. Um, so, so in, in other words, naively you would say, okay, there is a very big collision uh, between the two particles. And indeed there is. Um, but what we're calculating here when we're calculating the OTOC is uh, an exclusive amplitude. And you have to figure out which is the, what, what is the part that contributes to that exclusive amplitude. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yeah, he's... No, he, yeah, so he's happy with your answer. Uh, so uh, next, Tushar has a question. I, uh, it's not immediately obvious to me how to see that JT gravity is UV complete. Is it UV complete, first of all? Uh, yeah, it's UV complete in the sense that, yeah, there are no UV divergences because the in JT gravity, you have a two-dimensional field theory and a fixed background, and then these boundary particles we were talking about. So there are no UV divergences whatsoever. In, 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 at least if you don't consider new topologies. Uh, there, are, there are divergences when you sum over topologies. And if you're, you include, for example, a handle and the handle becomes very, very small, uh, then uh, there is a divergence. It's related to the closed string tachyon of, uh, of bosonic string theory. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I asked because in like a recent paper by Luca Elisi, Yorit Krutov, and Andreas Blumard, they argue of why we need to introduce some non local correlations between in the dilaton potential because of its UV completion. So, if you could comment on that. Um, I didn't get the authors you mentioned. I think uh, uh, Luca Blumard. Your, uh, Andreas Blumart and oh yeah 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 yes that's right that's right yeah well that that that's uh, a paper that um, maybe I well, did not get the point of the paper yes maybe. yes 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 so they they are trying to to see how we should modify the theory so that we get agreement with a theory that has um, that has a discrete spectrum a discrete energy spectrum yes, um, yeah. And they're also not considering matter. They're considering just the pure uh, yeah. JT uh, theory and uh, modifying the potential and various other rules so that the system has a discrete energy spectrum. Uh, those are issues that involve other topologies um, and exactly what you deal, what exactly you do when you have other topologies. Yes, yeah. So, so for the okay. yes. Just for the disk topology, we can say, okay, that yes, it is UV complete. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I think the way perhaps to say it is that in perturbation theories, if you don't consider other topologies, the, mm -hmm. the theory is perfectly fine. Uh, okay. In some sense, it's UV complete in a similar way that we say that string theory is UV complete. So normally we don't consider other space time topologies. Um, yes, yes. I mean, we, we think that in string theory, the sum over other space time topologies is also finite, but we, we, we don't have a lot of evidence for that. Yeah. Just like a like curious question, but uh, is there a signature of chaos? For example, if I try to work in the covariant phase space language, because in the usual phase space, I kind of like can visualize what the chaos would look like, but in covariant phase space, how do I describe chaos? Um, in the covariant phase space language, just for like say some simple classical system also. Um, well, I mean, th this phase space that we were discussing um, mm -hmm. could be covariant or non-covariant, could be whatever, whatever. Oh, okay, let me see if I understand what you're saying. Um, 
I guess your question is because when you do with the covariant phase space, you have to consider the full the full trajectory, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, right, right. Well, I, I think that when you that there will be um, it, it will be in the initial conditions in, in the operators themselves. So you are defining some operator, which mm -hmm. uh, let's say is localized at some point in time, right? I think for to answer your question, perhaps we should uh, go back to this picture. Um, uh, to this picture of the geodesics that we were discussing here, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we could discuss this whole calculation in the covariant uh, phase space discussion, right? This For is... GR. Um, and here, um, what happens is that the operator V is simple acting here in the future, right? When you try to evolve B backwards in time, especially if there are other perturbations, it becomes something complicated. Yes. Uh, Okay. okay, any other questions? So I don't see any raised hand or any questions in the chat box. So let's thank uh, Juan for a very uh, nice lecture. Uh, and we reconvene, uh, uh, we reconvene at 3 p.m. to continue the machine, lang uh, machine learning lectures. Uh, thanks okay. very much, Juan. So Thank we will you. See bye you bye. on Friday. Thank you. So you Friday is one okay. is in the evening, in the evening Indian Standard Time. Okay, perfect. See you. See you on Friday. Bye. Bye.